I call four words that we all know and immediately connect with thanks to today's guest, Ray Parker Jr. Also the name of a documentary about Ray coming out soon. Ray Parker Jr. is a legend of a guitar player, musician, producer, engineer, gear nut, and songwriter. Ray has made some records over the last five decades with some real upstarts here, just to name a few. Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Bill Withers, Herbie Hancock, B.B. King, Buddy Rich, Patti LaBelle, and literally hundreds if not more than that. Ray not only has a fantastic story, but also an epic home studio setup. Check down in the description for links to gear. Let me know what some of your favorite parts of Ray's studio are down in the comments. And thank you to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And let's go check out Ray's epic home studio. Hi, I'm Ray Parker Jr. This is my personal studio. And I'm gonna say it's very, very selfish studio because I just built it the way I wanted it for once in my life without any interruptions. I think I fired a few people, a few designers and stuff like that that were telling me what to do. So the first thing that's very, very, very unique here is this studio is very much more complicated than it looks. If you look at my house over there and you look at the actual graphic design of the house, in order for the neighbors to allow me to do this, the studio had to look exactly like the house. So that in itself was a, <laughs> a really masterminding yeah. underpiece. So I got the neighbors to agree with letting me put up a studio next to my house in this residential area. And the uniqueness of this is on a city plan records, this is actually a recording studio. Oh, cool. So if I sold a house, it's a recording studio. And I'm sure you realize the excitement of this because yeah. most people have like entertainment thing and if they make too much noise, the neighbors complain and they have to take everything out. Yeah. Well, this is already in the city records as a recording studio. That's great. So it's, it's done like that. That's so amazing. with that being said, now we're gonna go inside. I'm a guitar player, you might have guessed, right? <laughs> yeah. And we're not even gonna start here. We're gonna come in here okay. to solidify how much I love the guitar. When I take a crap, it's on a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is nice. Is that custom made or? They, yes. That's so, so cool. the toilet seat is a guitar. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> then we got our shower. This is, by the way, a two-story building. Downstairs, I have a complete wine cellar, a pool table. Yeah, pool table, and we could do a bunch of different stuff really? there. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's a two-story building. That's amazing. And part of what really makes that work is I didn't want the floor to be a concrete floor. Okay. So in there, when they were making it stiffer and stiffer, I, I re regulated and said, no, it's got to bounce a little bit and get the bass. Mm. It's got to rattle to give you that feel, you know. Yeah. That's weird. So here's my guitar case. This is not all my guitars, but this is some of them. Wow. And some of these are really, really nice. We got the, the unmarked. Gibson Les Paul with no wow. serial number, so I think that's a 52. Next to that is the guitar George Benson gave me from one of his albums. The black one is the guitar Stevie Wonder gave me when I went on tour at 18 years old with the Rolling Stones. Wow. So he bought me that. There's the one down here, the burgundy one, is Phil Up Church's guitar he gave me. Then PSR made me this blue one with this, the ash thing, which I love. And this guitar over here, Stratocaster, is probably the most popular guitar. It's a 56 Strat, one owner guitar. That's an incredible shape. Man. Yeah, it's in perfect shape. I got the case and the strap wow. and storage to it. And if you look at the back of it, it looks just like the front. I mean, you'd never know it was that old of a guitar. Wow. So some of this stuff, that's my P bass that I've had there. And underneath there, we have storage for microphones and a bunch of other stuff. Ooh, that is you got my nice. Gibson guitar table, which you won't see anywhere except the factory. And that's a long story. They actually shipped me some guitars by accident. I returned them and the guy gave me this table as a <laughs> gift. You know. Okay, so everywhere in the studio, if you look up, there's no mic cables. I mean, excuse me, mic stands. All the mic stands come out the wall like this. Yes. And we went with bright colors. If you see the walls are orange and green, just to keep people awake. And all of the bottom is Lumaline, all the lights, it lights up everywhere here. Yeah, that's nice. And all of the, the stands are like this. We have little, little uh, cameras everywhere, high definition cameras. So if you want to do a session on the internet, you can play your bass in here 
and this door closes, this door seals and closes. So the bass player is isolated, the guitar player, which is me over there, obviously you can see through to the guitar player. Wow, that's amazing that these, these doors like match yeah, the yeah. wall, they go yeah, they right match in. That's and so we got cool. double doors too, yeah. to stop it. So I can actually crank my guitar up in here. If you come in here, you'll see this is a guitar room. And the mic stand again comes out of the wall so it doesn't sit on the floor oh, yeah. and rattle and shake. And then we have the Hearback Pro headphone system if you go a little in there to the left there. And everybody can make their own headphone mix or put, you know, iPhone track in the headphones or do what they want to do. And then you'll see a camera up above that as well. Yeah, the they're so and small. And the camera swivels. Yeah, they're small and they swivel too. That's so you can crazy. move them around and get it. They have cameras here you see for the drummer and stuff. And then we did high ceilings in here so we can get a little rock and roll drum sound if we want to. And we got microphones up top there. That one looks like it's oh, twisted. It's okay. facing the wrong way. So we, have, <laughs> we haven't recorded drums lately, but that turns around correctly. Man, and my buddy in Toto, David Page says, you got to have some rock behind the drum set to get the right feel. So cool. we put a rock wall behind the drum set. And so then I got the Fender Rhodes here, the electric kit here, the regular kit there. We use the regular kit most of the time. And again, like the big, huge boom mic that most people have, like you have at your studio. I mean, this just comes out the wall. And this will hold any kind of mic. And, you, and, and what nice thing about these orbit stands is you just push a button, the mic clips in. Yep. And so you want to change it, you push a button, it clips out. And I have every mic on its own setup. Where if you just want to switch to a U47, something, just go clip, clip, and it's in and it's done and it's going. And it's really cool to see a studio fully take advantage of these with audio and video and the headphone systems too. Oh yeah, yeah, and the headphone system. This is really cool. And this, if you look at this and think about it, this glass is, I've always wanted one of these. I never could have it. And, and this was my sixth studio I'm building. I said, this time I want the glass to go to the floor. Yeah. So the glass goes to the floor. And if you think about this, how do you think this glass got in here? It doesn't fit through any of the doors. So yeah. when we were building the studio, before the roof went on and before the walls went in, the glass, two pieces of glass, they weighed 800 something, they, they had to both go in. Oh man. Look at the size of this glass, tall, seven feet plus tall. Yeah. And it's wide. So this had to be already set in place and several guys lift it up, frame it, and then you put the rest of the ceiling and walls in. Yeah. So the glass was the fourth one. But I always like the glass because I can look at the engineer and see what his foot's doing, see if he knows what the heck he's doing, <laughs> and vice versa, you know, comes into that. That's so cool. All of the walls here are done with what you call mass load vinyl. In the old days, like at United Western and some of the old studios, they build uh, two walls and they have space between the walls. Yep. Well, mass low vinyl is really, really heavy. A, a piece of it this big, I can't hold, it's so heavy. Yeah. So we, this, this, this studio is made out of metal beams everywhere to hold the load on the ceiling, yep. the load on the walls. And even with the glass windows, you can't hear anything outside. We're playing the wow. drums and blasting at four in the morning. The neighbors don't hear anything. That's, that's yeah, awesome. if you stand in the middle of the street and it's dead quiet, you won't hear the speakers blasting. And, and it gets loud in here. It gets loud. <laughs> and the drums are even louder. Yeah. But you won't hear anything. That's so cool. Then there's these new doors. When these close, there's mechanisms that go down and seal it to the floor. Wow. So it's not just like a simple door. Oh, yeah. No, that's, it shuts down. Yeah. And locks it. It seals itself. Then you have to, you have to push this to, um, to undo it. You know? Yeah, that's so awesome. So they're very complex doors with very heavy. If you look at these, they're... Shows you how heavy this door is. Yeah. You know? And so this part of my deal here, this is just something I wanted. Uh, I used to record at the record plant in Sausalito and the one here all the time. And I've been to Electric Ladyland, New York, and the Jimi Hendrix feel, yeah. right? Just the feel. It was always the Moroccan, you know, that thing with the, the bean bag. I mean, in the old days, I guess people would be smoking their pipe and doing some cocaine. I don't do that. <laughs> but the look of it is cool. Yeah, yeah. I just want the look. So I made this extra deep where we could put a Moroccan day bed in. And I got this at a Moroccan store and the guy said, what colors do you want? I said, all of them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, my walls are orange and let's yep. go for it. You know? And this actually comes with poles to go up here and you can put the thing around it. So I didn't go that far. Oh you know? yeah. If I was in my 20s still, I might've done that with the girls. <laughs> and but I said, I'm gonna be needing that. You know? And then we had this made in the back and we got lights going everywhere. Yeah. And the, as you see, the floors light up as well. 
and he really thought of everything with the, yeah. you know, like it seems like everything is hidden. Yeah, oh yeah, everything's hidden. nice. Yeah, everything's clean, everything's hidden. And this art piece came from Barbara Domsky. She did the Las Vegas airport, the, the uh, Wynn Hotel and stuff like that. So, you know, she was a fan of mine. I was definitely a fan of hers. Yeah. So I somehow convinced her to make this art piece to fit in the middle. I call this like the sundown or the, it's actually the center of the studio, the center of the universe. Yeah. And it's it's a crazy impression piece. Each one of those lines is a separate piece of glass. Oh. <laughs> exactly. That is crazy. And he weighs hundreds of pounds, so her and her husband had to actually drive here in a van from Las Vegas and hang it for me. Ooh. And so it's just uh, like you touch, it's, just, it's really, each one is just a line and it just really makes the studio pop. Beautiful. Like crazy. That's great. This I got in Macho Swiss, and that's a painted clawed knob. There's only so many of those, I think 50. So I got one of them. And then the other artwork here is Ernie Barnes' original painting from the Sugar Shack. And the Sugar Shack is a very famous painting by Ernie Barnes from the Marvin Gaye, I Want You album. Yeah. And he blew this up to show one of the band members from the I Want You album, which just so happens to be on that album, I'm playing the guitar. Yes. <laughs> so I told the famous artist, Ernie Barnes, I said, you don't know it, but you drew me playing the guitar. <laughs> so I gotta have this painting. So Man, that, that is one. so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So I took that one. And then out this door, see if you open it. I have a vineyard there. So we growing grapes. Yeah. Oh! I don't know if you'll be able to catch that on there, but look at that. Amazing. Yeah, we're growing red grapes out there, in which I have several years bottled. Man, really utilizing every, oh yeah, yeah. every square yeah. inch. That's so cool. And we didn't make a staircase going to the basement because we don't want to mix all this stuff together. You got to oh, okay. go out the front door and walk all the way around oh, okay. that way. Otherwise, you know, because this People is like, are coming in and yeah, they'd be bringing food and grapes in here. And it's not. Yeah, yeah. And we don't want none of that. And then over here, my kids play the piano. I don't play that much. I'm a guitar player at heart. But we got everything on the patch cable system here. We got live wire. What do you call that? Oh, the live stream Live thing? stream, streaming thing where we can do, you know, mix the yeah. video tracks together. I don't know how to use it, but I guess somebody will be able to do yeah. it for me. And then this console is just a mixed, mixed piece of gear. Instead of the old days when you had like an SSL and all, you had 36 channels, but all channels were the same, you know, 100 channels and they're all the same. Now you can mix and match things. Like I, I like the sound of a Neve console, so I got, you know, four Neve old 1073s and you can put, you know, distress and mixers. These are the BAE EQs, but at the same time I got API, preamps and API EQs. Yeah. Right? And so you can mix it and put the different things together for all the different sounds you need. Yeah, this is a nice collection of stuff here. Here we got 24 channels of analog, you know, stuff just like if you had an old console. Yeah. But they don't get broken and fall, you know. Yeah. Go out of style like an old console because you can pull in and pull out other things and replace them. This is actually the um, Allen size thing. I can't read it now. Tone Lux, that's the stuff that they make. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. And then these are the new R&D mm -hmm. Rupert Neves. Yeah, and these are some of my favorite uh, DeMario Labs. They made a old, uh, if I oh, used okay. to use these in the old Stereo oldies. tube compressor? Yeah, I think I used that on Ghostbusters, actually. Oh, no way. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, they just had a great sound that I really, really liked, you know. But for me, I started off as a kid playing the guitar and the clarinet and sax, but I also was the first one in my neighborhood who had a Magnavox mono tape recorder at yeah. like seven, eight years old. So I just been a gadget freak from then. And we're gonna escalate that to now front some of the first records I made. In fact, all of my first records were made in my home studio that I personally wired and bought all the equipment for. And I did the same thing for Prince. I built his first studio. So all of his hits were cut on the board that I got him and the stuff that we put in there for him. And then later I, I you know, graduated to American Studios in North Hollywood and I had two SSL rooms there. Then I had another studio in Mammoth and then this studio is like my, my home studio. So all of my records I've engineered myself and, and uh, have mixed myself. 
That's amazing. Yeah, all of the hits. I mean, with no schooling, no anything, just trial yeah. and error, doing the sound, you know, from all the way from Jack and Jill to the first one to Mr. Telephone Man to, you know, the Ghostbusters, all of it. That's great. So I'm pretty hands on with the equipment. Yeah, man. You know? I love that. Yeah, I'm a gadget guy. Man, we have a documentary coming out, and the documentary's called Who You Gonna Call? And I think it's a wonderful piece. This director, Fran Stryan, did it. The only thing missing in the documentary for me yeah. is all this electronic stuff. He didn't yeah. really harp on Ray had American Studios with Miles Davis cut in, Janet Jackson, I mean, Billy Idol. Everybody used to cut in my studio. Wow. So he didn't really harp on that. And, and if I had some more time in the documentary, I would have you know, went to American Studios and showed the public that side of me as well. Yeah. So that's the side of me that you won't see. Yeah. in a documentary. Well, that's great. I'm glad we get to get a little dose of it in this. Yeah, yeah. My career started in Detroit, which is obviously Motown. Yeah. So I worked a lot with Holland Doja Holland, who wrote all the hits for the Supremes and the Four Tops and that stuff. Yeah. Smokey Robinson was real close to Marvin Gaye. Ever since I was 15 years old, I did all the Marvin Gaye records and a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> and then my big jump from that to go fast, uh, Stevie Wonder called me when I was 18 and wanted me to go on tour with him and the Rolling Stones. If you can possibly imagine, that's the biggest tour in the world. 18, At the yeah. time, I'm 18 years old. Oh, and you don't yeah. want to know what all we did on that tour. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. And from there, I went, I moved to California. I started working with Barry White and the Carpenters and Seals and Crofts and Tom Jones and Engelberg Humperdinck and a whole bunch of people. And I started writing songs. I had my first hit with Shaka Khan and Rufus uh, when I was 19. And the song went number one. Then I wrote this tune called You Make Me Feel Like Dancing. I wrote some other hits too with, with Patti LaBelle and Barry White. But this one song, You Make Me Feel Like Dancing, I wrote, I didn't get any credit on it. But I put the whole track together. Clive Davis figured out that I did that and didn't get paid. So he said, give me the Jack and Jill song and I'll pay you, yeah. which he did. And that started my band radio, in which we had seven or eight gold and platinum albums in a row. Wow. Then my parents got sick and I thought that I was sort of retiring. I was like, well, I've done enough. I mean, I've got a bunch of hit records. I got money. I'm going to take care of my mom and dad. Then this song I wrote at the same time as the other song when I was 19, a tune called Mr. Telephone Man, this group called A New Edition recorded it. And it blew up to number one. And a week later, or two weeks later after I recorded that, I recorded this song for a motion picture called Ghostbusters. Yeah. And that went. Oh, <laughs> you know. man. Yeah. So, that, so my best year was actually after I thought most things were over. So, wow. you know. And That's amazing. Uh, just to show you some time frame of that, even though I'm thinking things are over, when I wrote Ghostbusters and recorded the new edition, I was only 28, 29 years old. Wow. So I had a wonderful career. And then after that, you know, more successful career, and I've been touring and playing and working on TV shows and different things ever since. So I love music. Music is my life. Yeah. There's no retirement from music. You, you know, there's no start and there's no end. You just keep going till you can't play anymore. Yeah, I'm living the American dream big time. Seriously, yeah. 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 Well, you can always go. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and all that kind of stuff. And I have a new record coming out. It's called Make America High Again. Yeah. Really? Yeah. All <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. yes. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's uh, I like lyrics, so all of my stuff is very playful and lyric oriented. You know? That's great. Well, I'll, I'll put links to all your stuff yeah. in the description for everyone to check out. And I really appreciate you letting well, us you. come in and do this. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you.